on this Tuesday night, support for Canadian seniors. How much it is and whether the Prime Minister's latest pledge is enough as calls amplify for long-term solutions to the crisis inside care homes. This is a tragedy. The risk of reopening, a fresh warning from one of America's top doctors. A possible vaccine for COVID-19 being tested in Canada. The collaboration between Canada and a Chinese lab. And bears without necessities. What the pandemic means for these pandas. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Lots of developments to get to on this Tuesday. From a new deal to test a possible vaccine here in Canada to an appeal in Quebec to wear masks in public. And there's new support for seniors struggling to make ends meet. The federal government is giving out one-time payments of up to $500 to help cover expenses. Canadians who receive old age security will get an automatic top-up of $300. Those eligible for Guaranteed Income Supplement, or GIS, will get an additional $200. About 6.7 million Canadians are expected to receive the payments. It's estimated to be worth about $2.5 billion. That money will help some, but it does nothing for the thousands of people trapped inside long-term care homes, unable to visit family, and vulnerable to the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in Canada. COVID-19 has exposed some uncomfortable truths about our society. We've seen heartbreaking tragedies in long-term care facilities and nursing homes right across the country. And in the coming months, the federal government will be there to help the provinces find lasting solutions. To give you a picture of how people living in long-term care have been affected, of the more than 5,100 people who have died of COVID-19 in Canada, over 80% were people living in care homes. Across the country, more than 71,000 people have now tested positive for the virus. About 20% of those cases are linked to long-term care. Long-term care homes are likely to be the last places where public health restrictions get lifted. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, David Aiken has details on the new support for Canadian seniors and whether it's enough. For many seniors, it's about time. Seniors have been flooding MPs' offices with demands for more help. We are hearing from seniors across the country, uh, thousands of emails and, and phone calls. But the government does not believe seniors need the same kind of help already provided to employees, students or small business owners who have lost all of their income. Instead, the government believes seniors on a fixed income need help with higher monthly expenses. We're announcing more help because we recognize that uh, every week seniors are uh, out of pocket a little bit more. Some examples, higher drug dispensing costs because of more frequent drugstore trips and higher transportation costs as seniors avoid the health risk on public transit and rely more on taxis and on delivery services. Meanwhile, poverty among seniors, and especially female seniors, remains a problem. The maximum old age security benefit is just over $613 a month, while the maximum guaranteed income supplement available to the lowest income seniors is just over $916 a month. That, plus a Canada pension plan payment, is all that more than 1.6 million seniors rely on for their total monthly income. Opposition parties are pushing the government to do more. The help right now that they've offered is not enough and it's also not permanent. We need to see a permanent increase in supports for seniors so they can live with dignity and respect. And seniors' advocacy groups like CARP remember that the Trudeau Liberals have yet to make good on campaign promises to boost both old age security and Canada pension plan benefits. We want that to come in so they have a permanent uh, increase in the OAS, the CPP, not the uh, temporary uh, 500. That's not going to help seniors in the long run. And in the meantime, no date has yet been set when the new one-time only checks will be sent out. The government will only say that it will be within weeks. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. As we've said, the people most vulnerable to COVID-19 in Canada are living in long-term care homes. The problems there are long-standing and have been laid bare by this pandemic. Tonight, Mike Armstrong looks at the deadly deficiencies and the demands for change. 
Even before COVID-19 hit Canada, there were warnings about what it could mean for seniors and seniors' residences. Despite that, the virus was still able to get into hundreds of residences across Canada. Patients rights advocate Paul Brunet says in some facilities, COVID-19 spread like a brush fire because governments were asleep at the wheel. When we woke up, the fire was already in long-term facilities. That's probably around two months uh, late. Now, Brunet is one of the people who've been sounding the alarm about long-term care facilities for years. What the crisis has done is expose the fragility of the system, and as a result, politicians now see the flaws as well. There are serious, underlying challenges facing these facilities. This is a tragedy. The federal government is now promising a review of what went wrong, as are several provinces. One of the major issues many point to is labour. A recent study by a Canadian think tank calls for a heavy investment in staffing. In terms of their numbers, in terms of uh, their education and training, uh, in terms of the autonomy we give them, a whole range of things. There are also calls for more inspectors and inspections. In Quebec, there are reports this week some facilities hadn't been visited in as much as five years. That's actually not far off from what the current rules require. They have to be inspected at least one time every three years. One option Quebec's premier has floated is the government taking over private residences. Well, critics say that would be like nationalizing the horror stories that they hear more complaints about public facilities than private ones. You are not even doing the right job in the public and you want to nationalize it? I don't want that. No, no, no. Now, the issue will be front and centre Wednesday in Ottawa. The House of Commons Health Committee is holding a hearing focused specifically on long-term care facilities and seniors. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. For the first time since the pandemic was declared, Quebec's Premier Francois Legault showed up at his daily press briefing wearing a mask. Legault is now strongly recommending Quebecers wear a mask when they leave home to help reduce the spread of the virus. It is not mandatory in Quebec, partly because of a supply shortage. Legault says wearing masks does not take the place of proper hand washing and physical distancing where possible. Staff entering the West Wing of the White House are now required to wear masks, and anyone who gets near the president must be tested. It's a reflection of how seriously the White House is now taking the risk. Most American states are now pressing ahead with plans to loosen public health restrictions. And today, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who has served under six presidents, cautioned against rushing to reopen and what it could lead to. Jackson Prosco reports. Randomized trial. The first congressional hearing of the coronavirus era brought little good news. There is a real risk that you will trigger an outbreak that you may not be able to control. With witnesses appearing from their homes, senators press them on what it will take to reopen a nation with the highest number of cases and deaths in the world. Staying at home indefinitely is not the solution to this pandemic. The experts warned repeatedly about the risks of relaxing measures too quickly and suggested the official death toll of more than 80,000 is likely missing the true scale of the pandemic. I think you are correct that the number is likely higher. I, I don't know exactly what percent's right. higher, but almost certainly it's higher. One Republican senator who contracted the virus himself cast doubt on those words of caution. I don't think you're the end all. I don't think you're the one person that gets to make a decision. I have never made myself out to be the end all and only voice in this. I'm a scientist, a physician, and a public health official. I give advice according to the best scientific evidence. The head of the Centers for Disease Control said the U.S. needs to increase contact tracing by five to tenfold to prevent future outbreaks. There were warnings that a vaccine won't be ready if children are sent back to school in the fall. A worry as cases of a mysterious inflammatory illness linked to COVID-19 rise in young people. We have met the moment and we have prevailed. All of it contradicts the message delivered by President Donald Trump just 24 hours earlier as he touted the increase in testing in the U.S. I find our testing record nothing to celebrate whatsoever. Jackson, not many people contradict the president without getting fired. Has Dr. Fauci been sidelined or is he still the voice of reason influencing President Trump? 
Well, Donna, he's certainly seen his role change in recent weeks. He's less visible. There are no more daily White House coronavirus briefings. Fauci is, though, still working behind the scenes inside the White House to help shape policy. We should point out, though, a poll that came out today is not likely to make the president happy. It shows 67 percent of Americans trust Anthony Fauci. Only 36 percent trust the information they're getting from the president right now. Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. It's hoped gradually easing restrictions will lessen the likelihood of a new wave of community transmission here in Canada. As the provinces and territories take the first steps to reopen the economy, one of the things they're watching is the reproduction rate of COVID-19, which helps predict how quickly infections can spread. Eric Sorensen explains how it works and what it indicates. Here's your purchase. As Canada eases restrictions, the concern is the coronavirus infection will spread in the community. Countries are watching each other to see what works and what doesn't. Cheers. At the forefront, Germany has open bars, shops and some schools. Even gyms with their heavy breathing and shared equipment. But already, Germany is seeing a new rise in the spread of COVID-19. The reproduction rate, R, said this health official last week, was below 1. But this week, R is up to 1.1. We are taking very seriously the reproduction factor, he says, because R above 1 is the threshold for trouble. The R is a measurement of a disease's ability to explode in your community. R, the reproduction number for COVID, works like this. If one infected person passes on the virus to one other, R is 1. If it's passed on to two others, R is 2, and that is very bad. Now, if you have physical distancing and the infected person passes on to, say, on average, just 0.5 other people, the R is 0.5, and that is very good. Here's why. The population at large, if you have 1,000 infected people, they will infect at R2, 2,000 other people, and in the next round after that, they'll infect 4,000. Now, if it's R.5, that 1,000 will infect only 500, and the 500 will infect only 250. If you have five more rounds of infections, well, at R2, that number will climb to above 120,000, whereas at R.5, it will drop to eight. So. Are below one or above one is the difference between exponential growth or the virus gradually disappearing. Where is Canada right now? The R reproductive number is estimated at 0.66, well below one. In fact, every province is doing relatively well, many with very few cases. But experts say it's vital to keep physical distancing. As the economy opens up, I think we're on a, we're on a good path towards keeping that reproduction number low. As social life restarts, an arcane but simple formula, the R number, can tell us how we're doing. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. Canada is collaborating with a Chinese lab to begin human trials of a vaccine candidate for COVID-19 here in Canada. The National Research Council has made an agreement with CanSino Biologics in China, a laboratory it's worked with since 2013. Human clinical trials of a possible vaccine are already in their second phase in China. The NRC is hoping to expedite phase one and two trials here in Canada. Chinese researchers created this potential vaccine using living cells that were originally grown by NRC scientists and that were used to develop the Ebola vaccine. There is a lot of complementarity and uh, expertise and knowledge that we have uh, about this vaccine. And we are quite confident that we will be able to produce this vaccine uh, easily in our facilities. If the human clinical trial proceeds and is successful, the vaccine could be available for emergency use in Canada by the fall. CanSino needs approval from Health Canada to begin the trials here. It's hoped to have a made-in-Canada vaccine. The federal government has earmarked $44 million to upgrade manufacturing capabilities at the NRC production facility in Montreal. Eight other vaccines have reached the stage of human clinical trials, including in the U.S., Germany and the U.K. And there are about 100 other potential vaccines being worked on. They're in the earlier stages of development. That's according to the World Health Organization. Reaching the stage of human trials does not mean success is guaranteed. Most trials fail, and it usually takes years for a new vaccine to be approved for use.
An aggressive round of testing is going to begin in Wuhan, China, where the first cases of COVID-19 were discovered and where the world's first lockdown happened. A cluster of six new cases of COVID-19 were discovered in Wuhan. It's feared the virus could begin spreading again in the community, so a plan is being made to test all of Wuhan's 11 million residents within 10 days. A Canadian rock star condemned coming up Brian Adams' tirade and the tidal wave of criticism. In Nova Scotia, investigators are trying to figure out how the man behind one of this country's worst mass killings was able to plan his deadly rampage without getting caught. As Ross Lord reports, new photos of the killer's home may offer some clues. Photos obtained by Global News show the gunman's home in Portapec last November, five months before his rampage. Inside, there are images of a spacious bar. Another picture shows a series of at least eight motorcycles. Then there's this one, a car decorated like an RCMP cruiser with the same identifying number, 28B11, as this car, the one the gunman drove during the killing spree. The contractor who took the pictures wishes to remain anonymous, but says he turned them over to investigators shortly after the massacre. To gain insight into the killer's actions, the RCMP says it will conduct a psychological autopsy. Such autopsies examine a wide range of issues, everything from how a killer relates to others, to warning signs, to abuse he might have perpetrated or suffered previously. Psychologists who advocate for psychological autopsies say examining killers more closely can save lives. I think it's important that we as Canadians commit to a course of action to use the events of Border Pick to lower the probability that this ever happens again. Some pieces of the puzzle are coming into focus. The Mounties say they've identified the supplier that made the RCMP decals on the killer's car. The decals were actually produced without the business owner's consent. Now the business owner and the person who created the decals are cooperating with police. Investigators say witnesses have told them the gunman had a large supply of gasoline in Portapec. They believe he used it as an accelerant to start fires during the rampage. Ross Lohr, Global News, Windsor, Nova Scotia. Ahead, speaking out about surveillance from China, a Chinese-Canadian woman says she's being targeted. Brian Adams has learned a lesson. The Canadian singer-songwriter has apologized after his Instagram post was condemned by people around the world as racist. I'm going to read it, so apologies in advance. Adams blames the COVID-19 pandemic on some effing, bat-eating, wet market, animal-selling, virus-making, greedy bastards. He was lamenting the cancellation of a concert series he was supposed to perform at London's Royal Albert Hall. People called him crass and racist. He deleted that rant and posted this. Apologies to any and all that took offense to my posting yesterday. No excuse. I just wanted to have a rant about the horrible animal cruelty in these wet markets being the possible source of the virus and promote veganism. Here's the thing. According to the World Health Organization, all available evidence is the virus did originate in animals in China. It could have come from bats, but it's still not certain. Nor is it clear how and where the virus jumped the species barrier to humans. There is no evidence it was made by anyone. Adam says he has love for all people and that his thoughts are with everyone dealing with this pandemic around the world. A Chinese-Canadian woman who is a vocal opponent of the Chinese Communist Party says she and her family are paying the price. Anastasia Lin was born in China and immigrated to Canada at the age of 13. She went on to win Miss World Canada and has been outspoken about human rights abuses in China and the so-called United Front. That's the networks the Chinese government uses to influence government policy in the West. Robin Gill reports. I am not anti-China. Anastasia Lin knows Beijing has many eyes on her, especially when she gives these speeches critical of the communist regime. Its censorship of information endangers global health. Now the coronavirus outbreak is a perfect example. But her blunt manner has consequences back in China, 
where she was born, and where her father still lives. He's been banned from leaving the country, and the family's business acquaintances are visited by an agency known as the United Front. When the national security agents invite you to drink tea, it means that they are going to meet up with you, issue a vague threat. The United Front is a tentacle of the Communist Party of China and operates both at home and abroad. According to Amnesty International, the operatives allegedly harass or threaten people of Chinese heritage living in Canada to turn on dissidents and shut down critics. The way they operate is through fear and greed. The two worst things in human nature. They try to intimidate you. If it doesn't work, they try to buy you off. According to security experts, these so-called spies are right here in Canada and are agents of China's Cold War with the West. The reports that we have are persons who have been subject to harassment by agents of the Chinese regime, whether they are persons in, in Canada with diplomatic protection, because there are more um, diplomats accredited to the People's Republic of China in Canada than uh, all other countries. The Chinese embassy in Ottawa did not answer requests from Global News to respond to these allegations. So we went to the Prime Minister. His response? We will continue to defend human rights uh, while at the same time looking to uh, protect uh, Canadians everywhere around the world. Lin refuses to be silent and encourages others to be just as vocal. There are already a lot of voices. I just hope that people will listen to them. There are people listening but many are reporting back to China. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. Bye-bye, bears. Next, why Calgary's giant pandas are going home early. Two pandas are packing up and going home early. The Calgary Zoo is sending its giant pandas back to China because it can't get a secure supply of bamboo to feed them. Urshan and Damao arrived in Canada in 2014 on loan from China and are much loved. They were supposed to stay until 2023, but fresh bamboo has been hard to get because of disrupted flights and misdirected shipments. We have a responsibility to provide fresh bamboo every single day. And that's a, not an option. And in this COVID environment, it's, it's too risky. Fresh bamboo makes up 99% of their diet, and an adult giant panda can eat up to 40 kilograms of bamboo a day. The head of the zoo said it's incredibly difficult to send them home, but it's best for their health and well-being. And that is Global National for this Tuesday, May the 12th, which is International Day of the Nurse, the date chosen because it's the birthday of Florence Nightingale. The British nurse was born 200 years ago today, and she was a trailblazer. She took care of soldiers during the Crimean War and established high standards for nursing, including hand washing and proper hygiene, simple things that save lives and are just as important today. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.